Hi, everyone. It's, uh, I realized when I was walking through the doors of this building yesterday that it had been a very long time since I've been here. It's a real thrill to be at the British Museum. Uh, 41 years since the last time I was here. So I came here as a, as a wee boy, teenager, actually. Um, so thank you to Lenovo for uh, sponsoring this event, and also thank you to X3D Media, uh, Martin Day and his team for, for mounting it. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honor to be here. So let me begin by uh, taking you to Boston. This is a Boston Logan Airport two weeks ago. I was on my way to the Hexagon Conference in Las Vegas, and I came across, happened across these construction workers, and I was really interested in what they were doing. They were walking down the air side of Terminal B with a tape measure and talking to each other. Oh, it looks like we have 14 inches here and seven feet there. And I thought, my goodness, we've failed. I felt this enormous sense of failure. You know, how long have we been in the 3D industry and, and this is the tool of choice? Uh, a couple of minutes later, I saw a laser scanning target, so maybe this was the prep work for that. But um, I'm here to make the case that, uh, at least in some circumstances, there are some other choices besides a, a tape measure, a, a sketch pad, and, a, and perhaps a plumb bob. So to, to do that, I'm going to take you to first to New Orleans. And we're not going to uh, Bourbon Street. We're going to the part of New Orleans where people go to work. And this is a push boat. It's about 120 feet long. And these boats ply the Mississippi, pushing barges up and down. And uh, I was uh, invited there by um, a company called Chip Architect, Chip Architects in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, this is the shipyard. And five of these boats, work boats, are under construction. And Chip Architects uh, has the uh, contract to document the construction of the, or document, yeah, how the first one is being constructed to create an as-built. The hull's been modeled. I mean, it's, it's uh, mo most of the exterior components have been modeled, but what they really wanted to document was the interior as it was constructed so that the four boats that come after this are, are going to be built the same way. So um, the prelude to this is that three people from Ship Architects went ahead of me three weeks earlier and walked down this area by hand, uh, took tape measures, plumb bobs, and sketch pad, and mapped out this uh, steel grid. Um, so the grid is this grating, they call it. It's just these steel bits like this. Okay. And they wanted a, an accurate 3D model of that to cut the plating that was going to go on top of there. So I scanned it with uh, this device. One it was actually exactly this device. And we set up a few targets. And you'll see in the background here, up here, there's a, a Leica Disto. We shot some control points. One of the earlier presentations, someone asked about survey control. We used the poor man's total station, uh, the S910 Disto. It gets two angles in a range. Anyway, we shot in some targets, uh, like there and there. And, and then I proceeded to capture it with the scanner. I also captured it with this device. This is the Lenovo Fob2 Pro Tango device. So this has a 3D camera in it. And I'll be talking some more about this a little later. But uh, this is a Lenovo phone that captures a color point cloud. And I'll, I'll show you some data from it in just a second. So um, I'm going to sh show the data from the, bear with me. There's a little technology going to happen here. Yeah, there we go. So what I have here is the ship constructor, which is really based on AutoCAD, together with the point cloud. They're registered together. OK? And it's all being served up on um, Bloom Cloud Engine. OK, so this is a company from Toronto that can take point clouds and CAD data, bring them into the same environment, and serve it up on an HTML5 browser. 
So I'm going to just manipulate this a little bit, rotate it around. And I want to point out just a couple of things. Yeah. So the first thing you'll see is that the point cloud is the gray data, OK? And the CAD data is the colored data, if you like, the, the, the green and the blue. And so you can see that this, they don't completely line up. The as constructed is different than the design. Okay, so this piece was done after the, the first crew went in and, and uh, measured it out by hand. The, the other bits line up very, very well. Okay, so um, I think this is really cool. We can take a point cloud and a CAD model, bring them into the same environment, and it, this, this took 30 seconds to load, you know, live from the web. So you could be halfway around the world looking at this data, sharing this experience. Looking for clashes, you can take measure. There's some measurement tools in this app. Um, so the, the the point I'm trying to make here is it's very very fast. Okay, so next we're going to go back to the PowerPoint if we could. And if we could, oh yeah, here we go. There we go. So I just got some numbers. These are preliminary numbers to compare the manual method with the um, handheld scanning method. So three people on site, they captured uh, 910 square feet. There's some travel time. There's some lunch time. Uh, we netted it out. It's approximately 50 square feet per person per hour for a, a scene like of that complexity. And um, with the handheld scanner, it's a, a between two and a half and three times faster in our estimation. And I think we're being conservative on the handheld side. It was really quite fast. And I'd never been on one of these boats before. So um, the other thing that's going on here is that the data we collect with the handheld device is already digital. It goes, and I'll show this a little bit later, we can go directly into a CAD system. We're not transcribing notes. There's no chance of swapping digits. Uh, it's already digital data. So I think that's, you know, that's, that's an advantage. So I just have one slide about us. Um, I come from our Boston office. Raphael Spring is our chief technology officer. And Raphael is ex-Google. Uh, he worked on the Google Glass project a long time ago, 2008, 2009. Um, he also worked on the Google Goggles project uh, and what, with the team that was to become the Google Tango team. So he's steeped in computer vision on mobile devices. Uh, the other person who's on our management team, our CEO, Brian Ahern, is ex-Trimble. Um, he sold his company to Trimble in 2006. And uh, they had a product to bring a billion points into piping systems and CAD systems back in the 2000s. So um, we're all from the industry and, and, and experienced. So what is handheld scanning? I'd just like to explain just a little bit about how it works. This is that device. And you can see you get a, a colored point cloud on the screen. And this is what the other side of it looks like. And let me just point out a couple of features. This has a is a structured light device. It's projecting a pattern of infrared dots. And um, there's an infrared receiver. The baseline between the projector and the receiver is well-defined. And we triangulate on these projected points and marry that to an RGB signal. So that's a very quick tour through the technology. Happy to explain it in more detail as best I can uh, after my talk. But let me, let me suffice it to say this outputs a stream uh, at 30 hertz of depth mapped RGB data. And we stitch that data together and produce a color point cloud. Okay, that's, that's the guts of it. The Tango uh, works almost the same way, except uh, the depth camera, which is uh, a little hard to see in here, it's, it's right there. It works on a time-of-flight principle. 
Okay, so we're measuring the it me the sensor measures the two-way travel time. The Tango also has three gyros and three accelerometers, and we use that signal also to uh, locate the ca to, to calculate the camera pose. So I'm going to show you some data next from the Tango. And if we, I'm so, standing a sofa here and a pile of wood beside the fireplace. I'm going to hold the camera still and take a still shot from there. Tells me I've been successful. And then I'm going to scan this uh, sofa. The green and yellow tells you the quality of the data. And, and so I'm just walking around. Just by holding the camera still and selecting the camera button. I'm collecting some 2D photos too, which I'm going to show you in just a minute. Some different angles on this sofa. Get the full 3D effect. And we'll take another image here. And the wood pile again from this angle. And we'll take a still shot there. And we'll stop the scanning. There's the point cloud. I turned on some images. See those purple squares? Those are the positions from where I took the, the image. And when I click on them, I get the 2D image. So we have trapped or tracked the 2D image or mapped the 2D image to the 3D image. And we can toggle back and forth. If we click on the 2D image on the right side, we're taken to the point cloud. If we click on the, you know, the purple screened area, it's a little camera icon, we're taken to the 2D image. So the problem we set out to solve here was we have customers in, who map crime scenes. And they tell us they go and map a crime scene and they'll take two or 300 photos. And then a week later, they don't know where they were standing when they took the photo. So they put the photos up on a wall or try and retrace their steps. It's a gnarly problem, you know, and humans are not all that good, actually, at figuring out where they're standing in a scene, but just by looking at a 2D image. I mean, most of the time you can get it, but sometimes it, there's some ambiguity. So we remove that ambiguity. We also have engineering customers that walk down construction sites, and they have the same issue. They take 200 photos, and a week later they can't remember. And if you're, trying to, if you're not the photographer and you're trying to communicate it, it's just even that much harder. So this is one of the things that we can do with the Tango uh, that I think is unique. It's a unique capability. So we're a young startup, four years old, and one of the lessons we learned very early on is that it's great to make a pretty picture on a phone, but uh, we couldn't sell any of these until we had some workflows built out. So we set on a, on a mission to partner and this is our list of partners. Every one of these, behind every one of these logos is a software application, at least one, that can read our binary files. And our binary files are small. Uh, a big one for us is 40 megabytes. They're typically 10 to 20. So all of these companies can read our data, bring it in, and do something useful with it. And, and they range from meshing to CAD to crime scene mapping to, to VR. So let me just show you quickly a couple of them. This is uh, our partner, Point Arithmetica. They have an application called Point Views, and they've taken our data and meshed it. That's a rendered view. And then here's the same data in SolidWorks. So we bring in this faceted surface into SolidWorks. And this is one button push. It takes maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Very fast, very easy. Anyone can do this. So that's one workflow. Um, here's another one. We have a partner, Undet, in Lithuania. And Lithuania in Undet has a, a tool to take um, our point clouds into SketchUp. And SketchUp, native SketchUp, doesn't handle point clouds or doesn't handle them very well. It bogs down. So I think it was Martin Day who used this expression, our industry is bookended by SketchUp on one end and Revit on the other. So this is one bookend. I'll show you the Revit uh, piece in just a couple of minutes. And this is, I, I don't know how you present VR on a screen like this, but this is uh, the, the pairs. We could serve this up in an Oculus Rift or Vive. Um, this is a pump room at an engineering company in Cape Town. It's a rainwater uh, uh, capture and delivery system. 
And the remarkable thing about this is the point cloud took about 15 minutes to capture. And the processing to get this into the Vive environment was five minutes. So elapsed time, 20 minutes from capturing the data and just walking into the room to producing a VR deliverable, 20 minutes. So we're not meshing this data. They're rendering the points, photorealistic points. So one of the obstacles in the world of VR, we believe, is the actual content creation. You know, we don't have weeks to, to capture this data or to model it. So, okay, this is not as pretty as some of the models, certainly that I've seen today, but it's very, very fast. And it's very, very inexpensive. And you can share this model with someone halfway around the world in, in just a few minutes. I mean, the transmission time for this file is seconds if you have a decent Wi-Fi. So um, our software on the Tango is in private beta right now. We've got uh, you know, some of the early users. And next, I'd like to show you a video from one of them. This was work presented at Google I.O. recently. I'm John Jerowitz with Walbridge Technology. Our options for scanning on site are good, but they take time and it's expensive. We need speed in the field to quickly filter, index, and align the data to the existing model to ensure accuracy. Recently, we were in the middle of mechanical coordination at the General Motors Tech Center Research and Science Building. We had modeling of the facility, but there were gaps that needed to be filled to ensure the systems would work in the compressor room. We were able to use a Tango-enabled device to quickly capture missing information, verify clearances, and keep coordination expedited to stay on schedule. Our industry has not always been known as early adopters of technology, but with devices like Tango, expectations are going to change. So the thing that gets me up in the morning early and keeps me up late at night is how do we get one of these devices in the hands of every construction worker? You know, there's the cost. We've cut the cost out of this. So, uh, you know, we can, we can all be contributing to the data collection, to the sensing, uh, to the capture uh, in, in this world. So I'm going to show you another example of this. Um, this time we're in Houston. This is a high school under construction. And this young woman has used uh, this Tango device, this very one, to capture a pump room. Okay? So we're not going to capture you know, the whole Crossrail project with one little phone. You know, we, we capture small rooms, you know, five meters by five meters, that kind of thing. But let me show you some of the data from this. OK, so it's streaming in. We're loading this from that uh, Bloom server. And when it stops rotating, this is literally how fast it comes in. There are a lot of people hitting this uh, internet right now. And the color data, the monochromatic data, is the CAD geometry. And let me rotate this a little bit. If I can. Oh. Please bear with me. There we go. OK, so what I'd like you to notice here is that the CAD geometry, this doesn't line up very well with the point cloud. The walls line up. So clearly, there's something awry here. So when we first showed this, we scanned the data. And then afterwards, we registered the CAD data to it and looked at the two and scratched our heads. What, what happened here? So, uh, and at first, I have to say, the project manager was not too happy to see this. You know, he, said, he literally said, you're making us look bad. But um, so we dug a little deeper. And what we found is that the architect had specified a pump. And, and its location. And the constructor, construction company came along later and said, you know, that's a great pump. All those are great pumps. But you know, we can't get them for six months. And they're kind of expensive. So how would any, this is the conversation with the owner, how would you feel if we swap these pumps for these other pumps, which we can get right away, and by, oh, by the way, they're less money. And the spec is close enough, so 
You know, get the architect to sign off on this and let's go with this different pump. And that's what happened. And it turns out that these pumps, these replacement pumps, you know, were oriented differently. The connections were different. I don't, I don't know all of the precise details here. But the point I'm trying to make is here, there were very good reasons to make this substitution. Okay? The challenge, though, is that the people who come after the people who put the pumps in, you know, putting in the ducting, uh, the ele electrical components, they're working from old data. Okay? So a good decision was made to swap out the pumps, but uh, the piece of the workflow, the gap, if you like, was that the model was not updated. Okay? So I think one of the ways that these handheld technologies can be useful is to update that model. And all of this has been possible. I mean, laser scanning's been around since 2000, 2001, and it's been possible, but it just hasn't been practical. It's not practical if it takes a specialist survey crew a week to show up on site because their schedule's busy, and then another week to get, the, get you a deliverable. Two weeks has elapsed. No, you want, you want to update the model, you know, five minutes after you install the pumps and discover that there's a discrepancy between the, the design model and the as-built, okay? So I think what, scan, what handheld brings to the equation is low cost and speed. And you know what? We don't need to know the position of this uh, uh, installed pump to, you know, sub-millimeter accuracy. You know, if we're two, three, five millimeters for this kind of work, that's plenty good. So next, I'm going to take you, show you some of that workflow. Can we go back to the PowerPoint view here, please? So how do we update that BIM model? I want to show you an example of that. So um, this very pretty office right there, is the training center for a company called Moderna in Cape Town. And I've, I had the good fortune to visit them earlier this year uh, when they had some Revit training sessions going on. So they have a Revit model of this building, and we scan one of the rooms. And I'm going to just show you a little video of that. Here we go. So we're scanning. You see that green and yellow? And I'm just going to do a, this will be abbreviated. We've got the point cloud. We pull it into Revit, or we open up Revit, and we get the coordinates of that window. I enter those coordinates into our software. This is going very fast. We line up the z-axis and the x-axis in the point cloud with the Revit model. And then I export this point cloud in, in our software, and we bring it into Recap from Autodesk. Okay. So you can see it's lining up, I've sped it up, but it really took about five minutes to do this or less, including the scanning, to line it up. Okay, so now we open it up and recap. If I save it, yeah. I'm just going to save this, and I'm going to save it as an RCP file, which Revit will recognize. Okay, and then we uh, open that point cloud in Revit. See it's lined up pretty perfectly. Look at the um, difference in that wall. One thing we notice, grip all that information, and I'm just going to use the arrow keys on my keyboard to nudge that information into place. So I can get a better view and I can just continue to nudge that information until I'm happy with it. Okay, and just like that, we've got it complete. Okay, so that was a rapid tour through that process. It took maybe 20 minutes to do the scanning, the alignment of the Revit model in, uh, with the point cloud, export to recap, from recap into, uh, uh, into Revit. So we've got, um, we've fixed the Revit model. We've fixed the design model. It was, you know, five, five years they had the model. They didn't know it was wrong. And the fix is pretty easy. You know, a skilled Revit operator just moved that wall into the correct place. So now the, the as-built and the, the point cloud line up. Okay? So again, the message here is, yeah, we, we can do this. We could do all of this with a, an expensive laser scanner, but we probably wouldn't because it, it costs too much. It takes too long. Okay, so I'm 
I'm here to tell you, or make the case anyway, not to tell you, to make the case that uh, low cost 3D data capture has arrived. We've removed uh, the price obstacle. I don't want you to think for a second that we're against or you know, we replace tripod laser scanning or survey control, we don't. But we do get along with them, okay? Our data and goes into most point cloud processing tools. Uh, we have some workflows to work with uh, tripod laser scanning. Our data can be Wi-Fi, sent over a Wi-Fi link uh, to a ZNF laser scanner. And we can do the registration between the tripod scan and the handheld scan in the field. Why would we want to do that? If we had a tripod scanner standing right here, and we spun it around and captured this room, the bit we won't see is the bit back here, behind, because it's shadowed, or, or behind here. So we can capture those with the, that data with the handheld data and stitch it together. So there's absolutely great use cases for combining um, tripod scanning with handheld scanning. There are also some new workflows that I think become enabled with, this, with the advent of low-cost handheld scanning. One of them is, um, and we're seeing this in, in the field, you can have some very senior eyes back in the office. They don't have to go to the field. They can inspect multiple job sites with more junior people in the field collecting the data. And the reason that that's possible is that our data format is very, very light. So capture the data in the field, send it back to the office. The project manager or supervisor inspects the data and says, OK, right, you're good to go. Or no, we need some more detail in this area. Or we've had a scope change uh, this morning. We've heard from the owner. And we need to know if we can do this. So could you move to that area? All of this happens before the operator leaves the field, you know, gets back in his or her car and goes back to the office. So this is a new kind of workflow that you wouldn't dream of doing if you had to FedEx the data. But if you can send it over a Wi-Fi link, it becomes possible. Okay. That's um, really what I had to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>